At the start of any survey, it's important to list the principal dimensions of the vessel you're surveying. Thankfully, the internet will give you all of the builder's details for the vast majority of vessels on the market, so all you need to do is copy them down, right? Now, there are surveyors who pay lip service to this simple element of the survey, but I believe it's critical that you measure them yourself. And in this video, I'll explain why I think that is so important. I'll also share some of my surveyor's top tips to help you get this task done quickly and accurately. Hello, I'm David Pestridge of White Hat Marine Surveying, located in the beautiful county of Devon here in the United Kingdom. My mission is to help people understand boats better. Measuring the principal dimensions of the vessel you're surveying delivers two primary outcomes. First, it confirms that the vessel is actually the size as stated by the builder and as listed by the broker or seller, and you'd be amazed at how often these are not the same. And secondly, it provides really useful information to you as you progress through your survey routine and again later when it comes to writing your report. Think how much easier and accurate it is to say, the skin fitting port side 3.2 metres after the bow and 200 millimetres below the waterline was noted to be loose, than it is to say, there's a loose skin fitting somewhere port side near the waterline. The better accuracy of your reports will indeed to both owners and to yard managers. Along with showing you the tools I use and how I go about measuring the principal dimensions of the vessel, I'll signpost you later on to a great resource I've put together to help you get equipped for measuring the principal dimensions of any boat. Right then, let's get down to business. There are four main elements to measuring the principal dimensions on any small craft, and I've added chapters to this video to help you refine any sections which you wish to replay and focus on. The first principal dimension we're going to look at is the boat's length. And there are three main definitions of length that are relevant to small craft design. These are the length overall, written LOA, the length of hull, LH, and the waterline length, LWL. Of these, we need to mainly concern ourselves with LOA and length of the hull. It would be nice to find that there is a globally accepted definition for each of these, but alas no. Some definitions of LOA include bow splits and swim platforms, whilst others do not. So, for the purposes of this video, the LOA for a yacht is measured from the leading edge of the anchor roller or fixed bow sprit to the aft end of the swim platform or transom hung rudder. In simple terms, whatever fixed item protrudes furthest at either end. And for an arrow boat, we would include any fixed fenders at bow and stern, as this overall length is critical information for navigating the inland waterways and locks of the UK. LOA is the longest of the hull length dimensions, and it's important for calculating swinging circles, allocating berthing spaces, and for arranging transportation. The length of hull is very simply the length of the hull itself as measured vertically from its leading edge to its aftmost edge, not including any of the items it increased LH earlier to get LOA. Waterline length is rarely used, but can be useful when calculating the size and disposition of anodes. Of course, if the vessel is in dry dock awaiting a new set of anodes, the waterline may well have been cleaned off and painted over, so this may require a little estimation. Measuring the length will require some or all of the following tools. A plumb line with at least 5 metres of line, magnets and electrical tape, a 30 metre tape measure, an 8 metre steel tape measure, white and coloured chalk, a ladder and your toolbox. We always measure length from the bow and always in metres, unless of course your local standard is to measure in feet. Although, just to be confusing, here in the UK when it comes to measuring narrow boats, we prefer to use feet and inches. We start by hanging a plumb line from the forward end of the hull and marking the ground where it touches with a transverse chalk line. You'll need at least five metres of line, as a typical 40-foot yacht with a deep fin keel lying in a yacht cradle will probably have its stem at least four metres off the ground. From there, we move far enough to the side to get a clear line to run our 30 metre tape measure out alongside the hull, allowing for the vessel's supports and any other obstructions. I then place another chalk line on the ground in line with the very first line to give me my zero mark. My toolbox is a very convenient weight to hold the end of the 30 metre tape measure on this mark. I then extend the tape along the length of the hull. Once you've got the tape to lay flat with the relevant side facing upwards, not always an easy task on a windy day, so you might want to consider adding a second weight at the stern end of the line, it's then time to chalk up the hull. Pick a good contrasting colour of chalk and then mark off the hull below the waterline on the anti-foul or blacking at one metre intervals, working away from bow to stern. These are the metre station markings which I refer to in my reports. And once you get to the stern, I then reuse the plumb line or make a visual estimation to mark the ground with a second lateral line and then read off the length of the hull from the 30 metre tape measure. I normally then write that on the rudder with the letter P or S. A very useful little tip when you write the metre station markings is to put a 100 millimetre vertical line at each station and then write the number to the aft of that line. That way you can instantly tell which side of the hull is in any photograph just by looking at the relative positions of the number and line. This can be really useful on narrowboats, as a flat midship section can be 15 metres long. I then repeat this process for the other side of the vessel, 
and I write that reading on the rudder as well. I would expect no more than 0.2 meters of difference between these two readings, which for a typical 10 meter vessel is a 2% error. There is, this is because there's a natural sort of parallax error when you try to get your zero lines perpendicular at the start. And if this difference is closer to 0.5 meters, I generally go back a step and remeasure. Having measured the length of the hull on both sides of the vessel, I then get my steel tape measure out and measure the length of any fixed protuberances at bow and stern, which I can then add to my measured LH to get my LOA. A quick word on accuracy for you. Using a flexible tape measure is reasonably accurate and is normally sufficient for this type of work. It is intended to be a confirmatory measurement and I usually quote an accuracy of plus or minus 0.2 meters. If you find yourself being asked to confirm any of the principal dimensions in relation to a legal case, it's probably worth hiring a laser measuring set from your local builder's merchants and taking a builder's right angle tool to help in getting the accuracy that you take to plus or minus two centimeters. When surveying a vessel in the slings, you don't normally have sufficient time to follow this full routine, so I find marking the hull in approximate one meter intervals using an amusing sort of crab style walk alongside the hull is effective enough. I think quote an accuracy of plus or minus one meter. It isn't as accurate, but it still offers a benefit to me when it comes to taking my notes and report writing. And I find owners and yard managers always appreciate being given more detailed instructions to help them find any defects later on. The second principal dimension we need to measure is the beam or width of the vessel. This is a critical measurement on narrow boats in particular, as the beam is the limiting factor in accessing many of the inland waterways in the UK. A client buying their first narrow boat will naturally expect it to go everywhere, and it will come as a rude shock when they get stuck in the first canal lock they come to. And you can guess who will be in the firing line when it turns out that their dream boat was built too wide for their proposed mooring and no one warned them. The tools and techniques for measuring the beam are very similar to measuring the length. For narrow boats, the measurement should be taken at half hull length, whilst for a yacht or a motorboat, it needs to be at the point of maximum beam. This is best assessed by eye when standing at roughly half hull length and looking upwards. You can then do the funny sideways crab walk I mentioned earlier until you find the point of maximum beam. Then get up your ladder and hang your plumb line down. Once it stops swinging around, place a longitudinal chalk line on the ground and make a note of the meter station at which the maximum beam lies. So this way, when we repeat the exercise on the other side, we can check to see that the maximum beam lies at roughly the same meter station on both sides. You'll be surprised to find out how many yachts aren't symmetrical and how many narrowboats aren't quite as straight as they should be. I recall doing a pre-purchase survey on a Sigma 36 yacht and was measuring the beam when I noted that the meter station for the maximum beam on each side was different by nearly a meter. As the survey continued, it became clear that the vessel had been heavily impacted on both sides at opposite ends above the waterline with significant damage noted on the top sides. And this came as a surprise to the broker, but was an even bigger shock to the owner, who had no idea that his vessel had been struck whilst on its mooring. Remember, if something seems odd to you during a survey, Always investigate further and try and find out why. Trust all of your senses. To take the beam measurement, I normally put my toolbox along the first of these chalk lines. I then move to the other side of the hull and reuse my plumb line to get the second max beam longitudinal line. From this line, I can then extend my eight meter steel tape measure underneath the boat until it touches my toolbox and I then read off the beam measurement. Once we've got that, I then write it onto the rudder alongside the length measurements that I took earlier. Measuring the draft of the vessel is sometimes made difficult by the lack of a visible waterline mark or because the vessel isn't level or the ground that it's on isn't flat. Typically, this is the least accurate measurement you'll take, but it's still an important one, as many vessels sit lower in the water than designed once they're full of the owner's gear or if the hull has been modified through overplating. The point of maximum draft varies from vessel to vessel. On a yacht, it might be the base of the keel or the rudder skeg. On a narrow boat, it should be the rudder skeg. And on a motorboat, it might be the keel or the stern drive. The point is, you need to specify where you measure the draft, and in the case of lifting stern drives or keels, what the draft is with the legs or keels up or down. I typically use my eight meter steel tape measure for draft measurements, and I allow for the added height above ground caused by the support blocks or the cradle the vessel is sitting on. On a narrow boat or a motorboat, be sure to check for any list of the vessel by sighting the waterline and how high above the chines it is, as well as comparing your freeboard readings taken at mid-length. You can look for this on a yacht as well, but it's harder to spot and is, in general, a less critical issue as the vessel is intended to heal in use. Once we have our draft measurement, we can then write that on the rudder as well, and by now the rudder should look something like this. An advanced surveying tip is to make sure you note the length of the rudder skeg and how much it protrudes down and how far forward it runs from the rudder post. This is really useful information to a yard manager in deciding where to place hull supports before dry docking the vessel. It's also really good information for the owner or skipper to consider when putting the boat onto a tidal inspection grid. 
The last measurement we need to take is the freeboard. A freeboard is defined as the vertical height between the waterline and the upper deck level measured at the lowest point of shear where water can enter the boat. Surprisingly few surveyors measure the freeboard and even fewer insurance companies ask for it or indeed understand its relationship to reserve buoyancy and down flooding angles. And these are the safety critical characteristics of any hull immersed in water. And the wise surveyor always gives a little thought to the suitability of the design that is in front of them and their understanding of what their client intends to do with the vessel. Freeboard is easy enough to measure using an 8 metre steel tape measure. And I normally take my measurements at both sides at mid hull length and then walk around the hull to see if any hull opening has a lower freeboard. Engine room vents or jalousies to give them the proper name are common culprits for reducing the available freeboard on narrow boats in particular. And don't forget that a narrow boat is defined as a Category D, Sheltered Waters Vessel, under the Recreational Craft Directive, which allows for mean wave heights of up to 0.3 metres and occasionally 0.5 metres. If the vessel was built before 1996, it is unlikely these requirements were met in the design and any overplating since would have reduced further what little freeboard was originally present. On all surveys, I compile a table of skin fittings and hull apertures, noting their metre station, height above or below the waterline and their composition. I then complete this table once I'm inside the vessel, noting the internal material of the fitting, the presence or otherwise of a seacock, its serviceability, the hose clamping arrangements, the security of the fitting, and its purpose. A failed skin fitting below the waterline can be similar to having a fire hose filling your bilge, and this data is really useful to owners and yard managers. On narrow boats, make sure you open up the weed box and measure the freeboard inside between, between the waterline and the underside of the hatch ceiling plate. It should be at least 250 millimeters. Make sure you comment if it isn't, and on the condition of the hatch seal itself. I mentioned a great resource earlier, which I think you'll find really useful. Using kit.co, I've put together some kit lists with all of the tools we've discussed here. In there, you can find a brief description of the product, why I like it, and what it adds to my surveying. And these are all tools that I've used in my day-to-day -day marine surveying work, and they're based on my personal experience gained since I started surveying small craft in 2008. Alongside each item, I put an Amazon link, which will take you to the Amazon store of your region. As a final thought, I found most of the measurements I take are within 3% of the stated figures and they're spot on about 25% of the time, which for measuring with a flexible tape, often on uneven ground, isn't too bad in my opinion. As with all things, with practice you get better, but I never assume the boat is either as it is stated to be or that my measurements are perfect. And remember, many boats have misleading names, such as a Bavaria 32 yacht, which is actually just under 34 feet long. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you found it useful, why not support the channel and buy me a beer using the link below. I'll see you all next time.